Hi, my name is Noah Warren, and uh, I coordinate Lunch Pumps with Jeffrey G. O'Brien. It's my distinct pleasure to introduce Shane McRae this afternoon. Shane has published seven books of poetry in the past 10 years. I'm going to let that sink in. It's a prodigious output and a testament both to the power of his vision and this country's appetite for it. These inventive, pained, and masterful books are, line by line, the record of an ongoing search for a usable past, for a present aware to, but not paralyzed by its burdens, for a habitable future. Even as each book strikes us with novelties, a theme, a form, and character, we recognize their continuities of sound and style. And perhaps the most characteristic feature of McRae's verse is the effect he's perfected of imperfection, by which I mean both that flaw in the human condition and in the grammatical sense of an action whose end is unclear and may be ongoing. In his first book, 2011's Mule, he writes in lines remarkable for their motion and their curious stasis, we married in an open field, a wide and open field, a field of wild and running horses, a field of horses running through. We married in an open wide. His lines feel like they've just been written down, which is to say their allegiance is already split, torn between an effort to capture instant by instant change and the instinct for control that print indicts. You might have heard the tightly wound iambic rhythms when I quoted. What's hard to capture in speech are the various ways he's developed to interrupt a standard pentameter line with spaces and slashes, or to overcharge it so that the ear is always in tension with and often outrunning the eye. McRae's poems often feel so addictingly propulsive that we barely notice the ways they rephrase themselves as they develop. His characteristic needle skips stage the simultaneity of forward motion and its revision as it passes into history. In those lines from Mule, McRae marries in an open wide, a space of possibility foreclosed by its absolute pastness. His most recent book, Sometimes I Never Suffered, flags in its title a paradoxical time only imaginable through the condensation of McRae's language. A corner of heaven where a recurring speaker, Jim Limber, Jefferson Davis's adopted mulatto son is sometimes able to forget his suffering. As such, the book is frequently concerned with gaps and rifts in memory where the particulars of terror have been scrubbed to brightness. These emerge as the book's various violent or lobotomized heavens and represent on a larger scale, McRae's forceful imagination and defense of a space just a little outside history a haunted fiefdom of the imagination. It's a space and a time that much poetry often has in mind. But one thing I find so remarkable about Shane's verse is how gaps and pauses open at the smallest level, at the line, at meter, flower into the American cosmogony he is now built across his past three books. Like Dante and Milton, Duncan and Mackey, he's married a structural firmness of vision and conscience with the freedom of imagination and the fluency of alert language. It's a mode with risks. Most vividly, that disconnection from the actual should untether poetry from the earth and allow the reader to ask why. But this is one of McRae's deep themes, an exploration of how our embodied experience controls what we can imagine, even as the cordon of imagination allows us a space to repair, however tentatively, our experience. His purgatory, his hell, and his heaven are riven along the same lines as this nation is. They challenge us to see how both whiteness and blackness feed on and generate unequal mythologies. McCray, with his divine theater, creates an arena where these mythologies can be crumpled together. And at the sight of that crumple, that nexus, we find inevitably a mind waiting for us, a perspective and an experience waiting to speak itself into being. Jim Limber, or a hastily assembled angel. This is intersectionality as a cosmic principle. Shane is the recipient of too many awards to list here and an assistant professor at Columbia. 
Please join me in welcoming a powerful poet of the human and the divine. Uh, thank you, Noah, for that introduction. Uh, and uh, thank you again. And thank you, Jeffrey, for putting this together. And thank you, everyone involved, uh, for making this happen. And uh, also all of you for coming. Um, so um, I'm going to read for about 30 minutes or so. Um, one always feels one must apologize if I'm going to read that long, but I'm going to try to not apologize, but just know it's in my head. I will apologize for how bright I am. I'm, I'm using my phone uh, to Zoom because um, I've never had my phone freeze, whereas uh, that happens on my laptop all the time. So anyway, um, everything I'm going to read is um, in some sense new. Um, I'm going to read from uh, groups of poems that uh, I'm in the midst of working on right now, um, and also from um, recent poems from uh, my next book. Um, but I'm going to start with uh, uh, a group of poems that um, is, I guess, uh, I'd like to think I'm in the middle of working on. It's hard to know. <clears throat> and uh, this first poem is called In the Ditch Where the Camera Finds My Body. I'm splashing in the driveway in a ditch in which a corpse of rain has gathered. Here, a corpse has gathered. Wearing nothing, a full diaper, I am three. A clear sky leans as if upon a bar upon the house, and everyone in the picture, my grandmother, me, I am, the rain come down. My mother's parents have just kidnapped me. I am the corpse in which I play. I'm dancing in the corpse. The clear sky sickens watching but with no clouds in the sky the sky can't move away behind me picking flowers my mother's mother sees the green has fled the leaf oh reader listener stay you are now evident um <clears throat> and this is called uh something grand i was we must have flown i don't remember flying my mother's parents, me, a three-year-old, we must have flown, we couldn't have, if who was going to drive the car from Oregon to Texas, Salem, that means peace, to Austin. I think he was a soldier, Steve F. Austin. I see us sometimes in a C-130, a military plane, but big enough for us, our car and things from Oregon to Texas, Salem, that means peace. Too big for us, our car and things, but shouldn't it have been too big, enormous, something grand? I was being kidnapped. Shouldn't it have been impossible? 100,000 pounds of steel, aluminum, and blood in the sky, itself incredulous and mocking. Shouldn't a flock of birds have struck the prop like laughter? The sky have shamed us then from its first heart. This is... Um, I always feel like I should be introducing things, but um, I don't, also don't feel like I, don't, I would say about them. This is after my grandparents kidnapped me, they moved to a new development. The only scenes I know are scenes my mother's parents thought to take pictures of me in the ditch. My mother's father in the yard before the fence was built, before the lawn was fitted to the earth, face like a face after a mauling. He is posing like, a hunter in the dirt. He grips a hoe and kneels in the court called everywhere. A neighborhood is coming. Where an armed man kneels and grins, that man will build a house. This is, um, I mean, this is introductory information, I suppose. Um, this is a sonnet, uh, but most of the ones I've been reading have, well, two of them were sonnets. This is a, uh, explaining my appearance in certain pictures. In pictures now, I do not smile and didn't. Then I would laugh if I was being tickled. And sometimes one, my mother's mother would tickle me and the other would take the picture, my mother's father. And so sometimes I'm not smiling, but I'm laughing, my eyes closed and my mouth open, almost like I'm screaming, but I'm laughing when I was a child in pictures with my kidnappers, with one, my mother's mother, always. I am sitting most often in her lap, her arms around my blurred waist. She has me on Ritalin. And the trick is wait until the laughing stops. 
as the mouth closes, you can take the smile. Um, I've got two more of these, uh, the both sonnet, uh, two more poems in this group. Um, this is a window in the, well, before I say the title, uh, I'm going to say the word um, GIF, um, not GIF, but G-I-F, um, although maybe GIF, I don't know, but I'm going to say GIF. I always feel like, always feel like I've read this poem once before. I feel like um, if I'm going to read it, I should say that because I also feel like people are going to hear gift. Um, so gift. This is called A Window in the House from Which I Was Kidnapped. The pale blinds rise and fall, a gift forever. The blinds move on their own. At first, my father stands with the string between his fingers first and middle pulling even. After it tears into his fingers, tears the first and middle skin. Him pulling, letting go his blood, staining the length of the loop string nearest him. At first he pulls the string for years. Eventually he steps back from the window. Into the room he steps back, doesn't turn now. He watches from a shadow in the room. For me, his child to be returned to him. I see him watching from a farther shadow. Whenever I look into his eyes, the room is endless. And this is, having been raised by my kidnappers, I consider the gift of life, or a gift from a thief. A gift that disappears as it is given, a gift from whom whenever they give you anything, you have to ask them where they got it from. A gift that disappears and takes you with it. A gift for which you will not be forgiven, whether you give it or receive it when my mother's parents kidnapped me. My grandmother said I would see my father again in a few days, and the big wheel he had given me, the gift she gave me then. And then, for 13 years, I didn't. You must close your eyes for the gift. After you open it, it's stolen, but it wasn't stolen for you. No one will give you who you are. So, um, uh, I... Two books ago, um, oh, wait, wait, that's not right, is it? Yeah, it is. Um, um, I, this book called The Gilded Auction Block, I guess it's two books ago because I have a book coming out, but um, uh, I published a book called The Gilded Auction Block and it has a, a long poem in it called The Hell Poem, um, which is part of a larger project um, that um, was con constituted of poems from, in the language of my chapter, three books back, The Gilded Auction Block, two books back, and the entirety of Sometimes I Never Suffered. Um, and in, in a sense, that project is done, but I thought it um, would be neat and fun, um, and also because I couldn't choose to do anything else, apparently, um, to continue writing sections of the Hell poem. And these are, in some sense, alternate continuations thereof, um, because in a, in a canonical sense, not that you know I have a canon, I don't, I don't know what that would mean, but considering whatever that poem is, uh, the Hell poem, it's finished, and it's all there. But these are all imagined continuations of or alternate versions of them. So they both are and are not. Um, and I'm gonna read three of them. Um, uh, and I should also add, it's the Hell Poem is sort of a journey through hell or a journey deeper into hell actually. Um, and the guide to the journey is this robot bird who um, is a servant of uh, Satan, sort of, it's complicated. Anyway, um, this is the robot bird tells me how it is I am in hell. My name is Law. I do the work. The boss says he created me in the, in the however long it was between when Cain crushed Abel's forehead with a rock and the first drop of blood hit the ground. I was the voice of the blood crying out to God. You know, the thing in the Bible, God says, the voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. That shit happened. I was a baby all fucking bawling and shit. Yeah, anyway, I say that makes Cain killing Abel. I say that makes Abel, poor dickless Abel, the first human and the father of all humankind. But the boss, he says different. He says it's him, the boss, for making the murder possible. And he's not philosophical like me. He doesn't have to be, but he 
is sure as shit he's fucking, he's smarter than me, smarter than you anyway. So listen, a couple weeks ago, we got a fact. You think there'd be a phone in hell? Fuck no, we fact. So anyway, we got a fact about you, shit for brains. It said you would be coming down and the boss wanted you to get a tour. At first I thought it meant the boss down here because, you know, he's the boss I think things mean. But then I heard him shouting and breaking shit in the throne room and I realized it meant the boss. And as, a, as this dawns on me, he stomps out of the throne room, sees the I don't know, the joy of knowing what's going on for once flash in my eye or some shit, and he's fucking pissed. Next thing I know, I'm guiding your slow ass through hell. But the boss doesn't want you to know you're getting special treatment, so if you see him, keep your mouth shut. Oh, shit. How will you breathe? Don't look at me like that. I know you're not breathing. It still works. So anyway, back to Abel. What I think is, if Abel's not your father, Cain is. After all, he had the big rock. And how many times do you think he saw his dad kill anything by crushing its head? Not many, right? Nah, man, an arrow in the heart. And by the way, that's what God gave you by telling Adam he could name the animal. God told you where their hearts were. Adam never missed a shot. You might think, this sounds like bullshit, but he was using a gift God had given him. So killing was like prayer for him. But Cain, he looked Abel in the eye and saw himself, not in his brother's heart, but in his head and crushed his head. And yeah, where else do humans start? Cain named the animal in Abel's head. Um, I maybe should have introduced that in some other way by adding... Um, the next book that I'm going to publish is called Pain Named the Animal. And lately I've also been filled with it. Well, I'm always filled with anxious energy. I've lately wanted to point out the forms the poems are in. And so that was in quatrain. They're unrhymed quatrains. Um, blank. I am a I am a tetrameter, not pentameter. Um, I don't know if there's any reason to care about that, but that's what it is. This is blank. I am a pentameter uh, triplets. Um, are they triplets if they don't rhyme? Not really, but that's what it is. Um, and it's called The Finger in the Ditch. Um, it uses the same characters, but they've moved on. I mean, that last one was just sort of a, uh, you know, the, the, the bird telling the unnamed journeyer through hell who the bird is. This one, what happened immediately before this as the, is the bird and the unnamed journeyer um, dove into the center of a mountain from the top of a mountain. Uh, top of the mountain. The bird had transformed into a large robot by this point. Um, and the bird, of course, survived the jump fine, but the um, person on the way down, um, because they're invisibly tethered to the bird, they're cut in half by the tether is attached to a belt they're wearing. It slices them in half, but it doesn't kill them because they're already dead. So they grab um, their legs as they're falling into the mountain and they pull their legs back up to their body. When they land on, when they actually finally land, they're completely liquefied. Um, well, their bones, their tibias shoot out of their shoulders. It's, it's a thing. Um, so, but then after they're liquefied, um, because they're in hell, all their parts return and they are reconstituted and it is a terribly painful thing. So this poem starts right after that. It's called The Finger and the Ditch. After my body splattered back together, or it was splattered back together by a hand or force I couldn't see, a love I couldn't see, a cruelty re-nerving my body for more suffering, the robot bird rolling its clattering shoulders bark. If you've got bones and nerves and blood in you, why aren't you moving? And again, I felt the cord I couldn't see, the cord that bound me to the bird, the cord that only minutes before had severed where it tugged me now, my upper body from my lower body tugging me forward, though the bird stood still, tugging me forward like the mechanism in a tape measure that erases as it winds the tape back in the thing the tape had been unwound to show. The cord had ripped me apart to show me no escaping him. A love of the suffering of others put me back together. Love stitched me together with a steel needle like a bowling pin, invisible just like the cord. 
just like the love. And the cord dragged me to the bird. I fell in the dirt at the first tug and the cord dragged me to the bird bouncing. A stone skipped on a lake. The puffs of dust, the puff of mist my body would make if it were skipped across smooth water. I stopped at the bird's feet, the robot's feet, and coughing raised myself, my palms on the dirt, first to one knee, then to my feet. You sure you still got human lungs? You fucking sound like a coffee grinder, grinding sand, one hard jerk at a time. The robot barked, the bird barked, its beak, its beak opening and closing like a plastic head, Tyrannosaurus head on a plastic stick, operated by a child who uses it to grab small object, objects a foot and a half farther from him than without the head, its sharp tooth, small tooth jaw he could reach. The robot barked and squinted, barked, fuck you, then turned around, but just before it turned, it looked as it had looked the morning we met on the blue, calm, sudden lake that was the gate through which I dropped to hell, the robot, a gull, I first thought tumbled from the sky, as if it had been thrown into my rowboat from heaven are so hard from hell it seemed to fly before it fell. It staggered as it stood, then squinted first at the lake, then me, coughed, fuck you, follow me, and flew off coughing. Couldn't choose, and followed it to hell. Now the bird walked. I didn't try to choose. I followed it to the verge of the boiling mountain that boiled as if it were a lake on fire. The surface of the mountain, the fir trees that leaped and sank like drunks on headless bulls, the bodies only, also leaping, sinking, spirits that can't see hell is riding them, and leap to bucket, thinking hell is men, and sink beneath its weight, and leap again. The bulls beneath the firs, and rocks like boots in snow in the dirt and in the dirty snow, maintained at the summit by enormous loud machines, so hot they melted almost as soon as they made it, the flesh-colored snow. They made of infinite flesh tone, no snowflake was the same color as any other, so they all melted and flowed down the mountain together and collected in a ditch at the verge through which rolled plants that looked like tumbleweeds but red and made of veins. The water shivered as the mountain boiled. The ditch was narrow. I stepped back a few steps, then I ran a few steps forward, and I leaped across it. And the mountain boiled more furiously, and the stream of flesh-toned water flowing from the peak at once flooded its banks, and all the mountainside at once was covered, and the mountainside at once became a face, but featureless and sweating off its skin. And I stood ankle deep in the skin and turned to the robot bird who hadn't leaped, who barked before I spoke. What did you think would happen, asshole? Who told you to jump? The, who told you to jump the ditch? The bird had been tugging his middle finger on its left hand, it, tugging the middle finger on its left hand as it barked, and now it bit the finger off, frowned and spat the finger in the ditch. And the red rolling plants in the ditch turned blue and seemed to die stopped rolling, just drifted in the shallowing tan water as the water retreated from the face of the mountain and became again a stream of melted skin trickling down the mountain. And the bird then stepped across the ditch. You gotta pay, fucker, or somebody is gonna have to pay for you. You're lucky that finger was worth 10 of you. The water where the finger had entered chased the finger as it sank, making a whirlpool where the finger sank that slowly widened it, looked like a hole in skin, bloodless, but opening forever. That would, if it kept growing wood in time, consume the ditch, the mountain, and all hell. The bird stepped forward and began to climb. So I have um, one more, it's shorter, of those uh, poems about hell. Um, for some reason, I just decided it would be cool to scroll right, like way past it. I don't. This is called the mind of hell, and it comes right after the line. Spread. My ankles turn the mountain sweat back, rippling one inch, two with each step I take, wading up the mountain. The brown sweat flowing down the mountain. Color of every skin tone merge, eddies as if it were a mind 
of flesh deciding, not a mind of water on a mountain weather, deciding at my ankles weather to turn, return to the sky beach light at the summit of the boiling mountain, upon which no shade falls or gathers. To climb against the effortless fall to the summit from which light is wrenched like water from the stone by heat that vaporizes rock, conflicting with the mind of hell that holds the rock together. Where the vapor and the willed rock meet, the light emerges, by which hell is lit that is not everywhere lit or to flow around my ankles down to the ditch at the base of the mountain in which the new sweat would not rise, would not raise the level of the sweat already flowing, but only thicken for a moment, only slow the sweat, consumed by uncontested heat, constantly in a constant circuit. A mind of water seeming almost to turn from being water, not to flow down, but climb, to change its being, as with each step I take, I tear it, but I have lived a life on earth and step and step and watch the water for the shimmer I make tearing. Well, I've read those poems and now I wish I hadn't, but that's okay because I'm going to read other poems. Um, or maybe the bummer will be compounded by me reading other poems. Um, so uh, a couple of months ago, I wrote this poem called Hex and it's going to be the last poem I read. Um, and I was really happy when I wrote it. I mean, writing generally makes me happy, but a particular kind of happiness. Um, and I wondered, um, well, I first wished I could continue the poem, but it, it got to its end and it ended. Um, and then uh, I thought it would be neat if I could do it again, but it didn't seem like possible. But then a few days ago, um, a variation on the first line of text occurred to me. And I just started writing another poem. Uh, Hex is called hex because it's in um, blank iambic hexameter, um, but also the first one um, was, I mean, it was actually named after the Bark Psychosis album Hex, but it's now also called hex because it's in hexameter because it's like the only meter you can write it in. Um, so I'm going to read, um, I've written three more poems that are after hex, and I'm going to read those and then I'm going to read hex. Uh, so this is... Um, newest one, which I just finished today, I guess. Um, and it's called After Hex 3. One's opportunities to be unhappy are one's single most inheritance. All other unities requiring acknowledgement of pendant interest. It's a miracle to whom, what person, you're still alive. The city is an alphabet of numbers. Those past 26, a sudden never ending in boundlessness, but once so short and narrow, you sang it as you smashed toy trains together, the sneering green engine smashing into the blue engine that really smiled. How useful, but how really useful. Reverse nostalgia of the unfamiliar grid becoming home. All comfort is decay. The city, you're sure is not a living thing because it gets harder as it decays, more fatal where, the, where there's less of it until it's gone and all at once not fatal. In hills you once imagined, green hills, cushion soft, upon which you imagined you would lay a gingham blanket, a wicker basket, then from the latter pull a cartoon sandwich and a cartoon slice of pie on a white plate, life a cartoon, the world, except the slice itself is plastic, a dog's chew toy, your dog's toy. It matches neither world exactly, not the cartoon world you when you were a child imagined, and not the world, the wrong Colors in the cartoon, the texture of the colors wrong. No life in the world, no life at all. But in the cartoon, it's too much of the world and all the life in the world, the plastic eye. All comfort is decay. And you have spent your middle life searching for the turkey leg, the greedy wolf pulled last from the basket in the cartoon, after watching which your imagination then developed almost without your input. You searched passively. It's true. You sat at the dining table in the afternoon, and who are they, this family? You want to say arisen, but you want to say they manifested like moaning spirits in a bog, uncertain where you got the image from. Every Thanksgiving you have sat at the festooned table in the afternoon, a bib from the red lobster in the heart of the next town over, around your neck, knife in one hand, fork in the other, and licked your maw exactly like the greedy wolf as if your hunger were a spell you cast on the food. But never has the cartoon turkey leg appeared. 
the perfect golden turkey leg you've hungered for since you were small when you first saw the golden leg drawn steaming from the picnic basket like a sword drawn steaming from the entrails of your enemy. This <clears throat> is after Hex 2. One's opportunities to be unhappy are both indiscernible and too big, like the gray wall of a gropius in fog. And as you rise, bewildered from the campus lawn, as you are helped up from the campus lawn, although immediately you kneel and grope for the shoe the building knocked from your now wet right foot, first as you rise, then as you grope, first you are asked, but then required to state your name and name the place. You think you will be able to distinguish your warm blood from the cold accumulation of the fog, but when you touch the grass, no, it's all cold. And this is <clears throat> second to last poem that I'm gonna to read today, and this is after Hex One. One's opportunities to be unhappy are dynamic, ever expanding, a Ford Mustang chasing the sun as it sprints panic to the western limit, which was the morning you first didn't think of the riot. And for weeks afterward, and following what once had seen, and anybody would have said so, seemed to have been a sequence of events in time, and only to the intelligentsia then hidden, now they scurry from one nimbus to another down the block until they disappear in dark. Then they reappear in light, then disappear again in darkness. And then finally, beneath the next streetlight, they're gone. They disappear in light. To whom what seemed to you a sequence was a sphere of time, expanding in a space with limits and with walls at its limits, in which objects are attacked, the space paved to what authority? The sphere of the riot for what seemed like weeks, but it was only minutes. The sphere was conveyed, the polished gem from hand to hand, one representative to the next one party to the other in the weeks of their competitive expressions of concern, in the minutes of those weeks, rolling a golden coin across scarred knuckles, a magician or a criminal, but both the coin a sphere in the space between two hands, a coin in the hand. Eventually, like bullets in America, the riot passes through our heads and we forget the riot, everything. What once seemed strange to you becomes your heart, America your heart's blood strange to you, hidden in you, the truest part of you unknowable, a minotaur of the hidden God who is not you, the God, not even of your own heart. This is my last poem. Thank you all again for coming. Um, uh, uh, thank you, Noah and, and, and Jeffrey um, for making it happen. Um, uh, and this poem is about six pages long, so I'm letting you know ahead of time. Um, and it's called Hex. One's opportunities to be unhappy are unlimited, are limited, but only by one's own imagination, which is powerful, but fragile, is defenseless, but is limited only by things. As Bark Psychosis did it in music, at the start of the new music, Hex itself the start of the new music, after Talk Talk started it, who after this heat started it, who after Public Image Limited, though John Lydon has since gone bad, or more offensively is who he always was, who after Public Image, Image Limited started it going bad, and not to mention Slint, not to mention the American. Lydon and Morris be gone, four are in America, America, for Trump or in Los Angeles, bad. Morrissey, not even new, was never new, except his talent was, and Johnny Marr, and always, the dead old art will suffer further life if new artists of irresistible ability work to extend it. Though such artists must not seek to extend the dead old art, or they will fail, but must make only what they must make. And if it aligns with the dead, the dead will live again what they make. Low string and keening dissonances when the strings ascend together, sirens of the cops inside. Their wooden bodies, their brown bodies. Listen, first, the sirens come from nowhere in the world except for them. For them, the sirens come, announcing nowhere. And then the lights from nowhere round the corner, red like an idea of fire, as the drums roll beneath the string, a shopping cart from far from where it rolls beneath the city, on a sidewalk in the day in the middle of the city, 
roll beneath the city the strings from which the sirens come, the lights that chase the sirens down and live as an idea of fire and nowhere no guitar. But space and stillness where guitars would be. Stillness and space and a boy singing his lone unhappiness in the midst of the raw world. To whom I would escape from the midst of the raw world. It's now oppressive stillness and it's windowless disease. It's timelessness. It's timelessness. It's nothing's happening in my life. I don't have time to be dead. Where to run from timelessness in the windowless room, in the room in which you sealed yourself at the start of the pandemic, hoping for more life, more time. As Bark Psychosis did it at the start of the new music and made a sound to which one wonders from life and in which one wonders still having arrived. One's opportunities to be unhappy are unlimited, though often lately limited by the end of the world. But maybe the end of the world is ending. Maybe soon one will be in small ways sad again. One's opportunities available to one's attention, Leiden to the horseman whinnying himself on the fetid, floating horse, long since afraid to kick his spurs and pop it. But he makes an eager whinnying, hoping to sound ready. He is ready to be the last American, Winnie and Heck, Winnie. Hills unfurl beneath him to the hill, beneath the surface of Lake Erie and the ice above the hill that seems to constitute the lake from somewhere other than the lake, to be a picture of a dead lake, the surface of the thing a picture of something else. How far we travel now to be in the now impossible presence of things to which we ride in light that touches and is never touched all things by anything, us, even in the light. How far we travel, we have traveled to, to watch the lake unmoving from the parking lot, approaching the moment it, the moment, was already in our minds accomplished, the long visionary gaze across the ice, in the midst of which, the gaze, the ice infinite has no middle, no middle, but is made of middle echo. In the midst of the gaze, the moment through which the visionary moves, we will leave our bodies gazing, or at least our minds, for once won't trouble what we see. Such peace accomplished. We have known our peace accomplished on the drive to the lake. And by the time we reach the lake, we've turned around already in our minds. Such peace accomplished and retreated from. Except we part, except we gaze at the white expanse and sigh, not knowing which emotion demands the sigh. And the sigh leaves us, staggering, a butterfly, our frozen breath as butterflies have staggered. You have watched them, seemed uncertain where to land, upon which flower. You've watched a butterfly choosing. Or if it wasn't choosing, still it seemed to choose a flower pattern like itself. Our breath escaping in the haze of its occasion. You, watchers, disintegrate and do not recognize yourself. But I am watching, and I see you breathing at once. I can't see beneath the picture of awe on your face, the image of the visionary moment. And even if it isn't happening beneath the image, I forgive myself for feeling nothing, no visionary moment, seeing you. And the hills roll beneath the surface of the lake. As Mogwai did it, no singing, but in guitar. And sometimes human voices singing, keyboards sometimes, in 1997, three years after Heck, at the start of the new music. Each guitar a wall and hammer bolt. If we forgave ourselves for making what we have made, we would destroy what we have made before we'd let ourselves enjoy it. No, we won't release ourselves to joy with our forgiveness, never. And so we build a tower from the top of which we hope to reach forgiveness. Opportunities for one to be unhappy are unlimited. A pitch of silence in the everyday unsounded. One's opportunities belong to one, but rogue unhappinesses claim their midst in a consuming infinity that even now approaches you. As Inya did it, though you didn't notice. Listen, the songs are hit, but listening, the sure connections between all things become long clouds. America, the sure connections fray in clouds at the Capitol, and those who scream they want you back have never seen you and wouldn't recognize you if you came. And those who lie face down on the floor in the chamber see the floor only. The woman on the other side of the door, wide-eyed and bleeding, sees no metaphor. Oh, music, where have you fled? 
own music, who will make it? Thank you. Shane, thank you so much um, for hexing the I am to further life and for encompassing so many kinds of terrain into your project. Um, it's a great way to end this series of readings for 2021. We will certainly be back in the fall, although we will be remote despite this anguishingly embodied image that I'm now sharing the space with um, because we need to make decisions long before we can know what will happen. Um, and we'll try and take advantage of remoteness to really book some great people who are far flung. I wanna thank um, UC Berkeley Libraries and um, our amazing audiovisual team. And I really emphatically want to thank Noah Warren, who's made the difference between theory and praxis in existence and in coordinating this series. And um, I don't know who's coming next fall and spring yet, but I do know one of the people who's coming, and that will be Noah Warren himself, who has a book of poetry coming out from Copper Canyon called The Complete Stories. Um, so we, will, we know at least one of our readers for next year. Thank you for supporting the series and see you then. Bye.